and welcome to Learn Your Color Computer. So let's begin. I'd like to say a few words about the biggest problem in the computer community today, and that's the closet computers. They're the ones that end up in your closet, alone and neglected, after a few fun hours with playing some games. This usually takes place a few months after Christmas, when somebody buys a color computer for the kids to play with. Then, when the fun wears off, into the closet it goes, to sit and gather dust, never to realize its full potential. Some folks may have just had a breakdown on them and decided not to get it fixed, even for a blown fuse. Well, this has gone on for too long now. With the millions of computers in people's homes today, only a few thousand of them have taken the time to learn their computer and take advantage of the remarkable power available in the small white case. Some people have even used their computers to run their own businesses. But this is not enough. If everybody who owned a closet computer was to become a serious color computer user, we'd be a more powerful group than any other. And this is what the series of shows is all about. So let's begin. Hi, welcome to the third installment of Learn Your Color Computer. This time we're going to teach you about the commands of for, to, next, step, and an L list. Plus, how to pause your program during operation. And we'll also teach you about the concept of nested loops. A four next loop consists of four elements. A variable, an optional task, a next variable, and the optional increment or step. Type in the following program. 10 for L equals 1 to 5. Step 1. Line 20. Print, quote, loop number, quote, semicolon L. Line 30. Next, L. In this short program, we have the four basic elements of a four next loop. In line number 10 is our four variable and increment. Line 20 is our optional task. Line 30 is our next variable. The four variable tells basic how many times we want to pass through the loop, while the next variable tells basic where the end of the loop is. The step command in line 10 tells basic how many digits we want to increment the for variable by. If this is left out, basic assumes to use an increment value of 1. To see how this works, run the program and you should see the following results. The program has gone through the loop exactly five times and your variable of L was equal to the loop value which we referenced in line number 20. Now what if you wanted to increment the loop by some other number besides 1? For instance, by 3. Change the step value in line number 10 like this. 10 for L equals 1 to 5. Step 3. You should now be able to run the program and have the results come to your screen as follows. Notice that instead of the loop incrementing by 1, it incremented by 3, a big difference. There are just a few simple rules to remember about a 4-2 step next construct. First, if you don't give your next command a variable to work with, it'll assume to use the one found in the most recent 4 command. Second, if you want to increment the loop, say from 5 to 1, you know, in the backwards direction, you must use the step command with your increment shown as a negative number. Third, there must always be the same number of next commands as there are four commands. 
That way you'll always have complete loops. As I promised earlier, I want to show you how to pause your program during the program's execution. This is accomplished by the shift and at keys used together in one keystroke. Type the following program as a demonstration. New. Line 10 for x equals 1 to 1,000. Line 20, print x. Line 30, next x. Now run the program using the run command to start the program going. At any time during the execution of the program, use the shift at keystroke. And notice the program stops where it is, but it does not exit to basic. The program is now paused, and you can now press any key except break to make the program resume execution. You can use the shift at keystroke in any basic program you have, except where the shift at keystroke has been purposely disabled by the program. And now I'm going to teach you about what we call a nested loop. A nested loop means one or more smaller loops inside of one larger loop. As an example of a nested loop, type this short program. Line number 10 for x equal 1 to 3. Line 20, print, quote, x equal, quote, x. Line 30, for y equals 1 to 2. Line 40, print, comma, quote, y equals, quote, y. Line 50, next, y. Line 60, next, x. Now run the program, and the result should be just like these. What the program does first is it counts from x, which is 1 to 3. Every time it counts x, it prints the value of x. Then counts y from 1 to 2, each time printing the value of y. Simple, isn't it? One thing you must always remember with nested loops is that you must close them up in reverse order of the way they were opened. Say if you had a line uh, 10 for a equals 1 to 2, followed by line 20 for b equals 1 to 2. Then you must close the b side first with line 30, next b. Then close, close the A loop with 40. Next, A. Now before we continue here, let's go over what we've learned about nested loops. First, we've learned that a nested loop is one or more smaller loops inside of a larger loop. Second, we've learned that during program execution, all smaller loops inside of the larger one are fully counted through before the larger one is incremented. Third, we've learned that no matter how many loops we open up, it must be closed in reverse order of the way that were opened. Now let's take a look at the end command. The end command is used whenever we want to terminate a program from running. A fine example would be something like this short program. Line number 10, 
print, quote, this is line number 10, quote, line 20, print, quote, this is line number 20, quote, line 30, end, line 40, print, quote, this is line number 40, quote, line 50, print, quote, this is line number 50, quote. Now run this program and what do you get? Assuming you typed it incorrectly, you should see, get the same thing I got here. What happened here was that when we run the program, lines 10 and 20 are executed as normal. But the end command on line 30 has told BASIC to terminate the program's execution. So the program stopped, leaving lines 40 and 50 unexecuted. What this means to us is that we can stop the program's execution at any point we want simply by placing the end command where we want it to stop. Now, say if we wanted to end the program at a different place other than line 30. Okay, here's how we'll do that. First, at 30, kill off what we have so far. Now, say we wanted to uh, get the program to stop after, we, after it says this is line 40. Okay, we then add line 45. End. Okay, now it should stop when it reaches the end command in line 45 this time. As shown here in the list, it is indeed right behind line 40. That way, those three lines which precede that line will be executed first. Now let's run the program. Okay, this time, the first three lines were printed. Lines 10 and 20 were printed as normal. Since line 30 is gone, we, ha we, have, uh, we have no need for it. But then it skips right to line 40, where it says it prints line 40. Then at line 45, it finally encounters the end command, at which the program is terminated and returns to basic. Now finally, let's take a look at the llist command. The llist command works almost identically to the regular list command that we talked about in a previous show. We can list a whole program or a certain portion of the program to see what we actually have in memory as far as the program goes. The only exception in this case is the regular list command prints the program listing to the monitor screen. The llist command prints the program listing to your line printer. Let's explore how this works. Make sure your printer's on and type this in. ldist followed by pressing the enter key. The printer then springs into action and lists the program we have in memory. In this case, we're printing out a program in which we tested the end command. In case you don't have a printer, you can look at my printout. Notice the line numbers. Since we didn't specify a range, the computer told the printer to print all the lines in the program. In this case, which in this case are lines 10 all the way through 50. 
Anytime you use the list or llist commands and don't specify beginning and ending lines, the first and last lines are used. If you don't specify an end line, but you can specify a beginning line, the computer assumes that unspecified last line to be the last line of the program. The same goes for not specifying a beginning line. The first line of the program is assumed. To better understand how this works, let's not specify a last line, but we will specify a beginning line. Type this. L list 20 dash followed by pressing the enter key. This time we enter the command. We press return. Once again, the printer springs into action and prints lines 20 through 50. Notice line 50 is the last line. We didn't specify a last line, so the last line, line 50, was assumed. The variations we've used on the llist command for specifying a range of line numbers can also be used on the regular list command. Keep that in mind. It'll help you out later when you've begun writing your own programs. Now, so far we've had to retype lines to change them. But there is an extra command in Color Basic which lets us change lines a lot easier. It's the edit command. Now, say if we wanted to change line 10 to increment to 4. We edit 10. Line 10 appears on our screen. Now we press X for extend. Brings us to the end of the line. We use backspace, back up 1, and then press 4 as the text we want to replace it with. Now, there's another way of doing this. See, our program still does run. Now we're incrementing to 4. Say we want to change it to 5. Edit. 10. Now, this way, we can space over with the space bar until we reach it. Then we press C for change. If you do not specify a number before the C character, it'll, it'll assume change one character. At which time, we put five and press enter. Now, say if we wanted to abort a change. Space over. And say we've pressed C for change and zero as the new text. But we changed our mind. Here's what we do. We press shift and, and up arrow in one keystroke. This means we're going to change functions. Then press A, and it returns the line to its original state. Press Enter, and we've aborted the whole edit without changing anything of that line. Notice, the program still runs. This time, we're incrementing to 5, because that was the last thing we did change. Now, say if you wanted to uh, jump forward in the line without having to press the space bar too many times. Say we wanted to space forward five times. Press 5 in the space bar. We jumped ahead five characters. But we don't want to do this, so we'll press shift up arrow and port the function with A. Now, say if we wanted to change more than one character at a time. So we wanted to change uh, 1 to 11. Space over. beginning of where the 1 is, and press 2 to specify two characters and C to change. And type 1-1 one, one for 11. Notice we've changed the two characters, and now we have 11. 
on the program. And you see, we are going by 11s. Now, as an extra little bit of information, I'm going to teach you about the merge command. The merge command is used when you want to take two programs and put them together. Say if you had like another routine that you've saved for putting into other programs, you can use the merge command to put it onto the end of what you have already in memory. Here's how this works. Say you have a subroutine you've written for a short program, but since you probably don't have one yet, let's write you one. Line 500, print, this is a subroutine. Line 510, return. Now what we're going to do is save this in ASCII format. This is done with the comma A appendix to the end of your save command. Now clear out what you've got in memory and we'll write our main program. Line 10, print. This is our main program. Line 20, print. Line 30, go sub 500. Line 40, end. Now this is where the merge command comes into handy. We'll get it in from disk, like so. Merge, routine, the disk drive accesses. Now, Notice the program, which we created earlier and saved in ASCII format, is now at the end of our program. And by running it, you notice it works fine. Now let's go over what we've learned this time and see what we've got. First, we learned about four next and step commands, which show us how to make loops in our programs and to make counts so we can do multiple commands multiple times. We've also learned how to use the end command, which allows us to stop the program for whatever reason anytime we want. We've also seen how to use nested loops, which allowed us to put more than one loop inside of a bigger loop. Now this concludes another installment of Learn Your Color Computer. Next time we'll learn, we'll learn you about the basic commands of random, print at, set, reset, joystick, and peak. See you then. I've decided to make this show a little shorter than usual, so we'll have a few minutes to talk about our club, the Coco Sig which is short for Color Computer Special Interest Group. Here with me today is Mr. Andrew Boudreaux, who will talk about Node 2, the second half of the meeting, which meets on the second Saturday of the month. I'll be telling you about Node 1, which meets on the fourth Saturday of the month. At Node 1, we have generally the people who have been with the club the longest. We get together, talk about what's new, what we'd like to see, and just relax and have a good time. And Mr. Boudreau, tell us about Node 2. Well, Node 2 is more or less the formal meeting for the Color Computer Club. What happens is, at this meeting we have uh, classes and instruction for computer use, we have guest speakers, we have visitors, we actually have uh, lecturers that come to talk to us about different things in our computer community. The one thing that uh, we do enjoy is that on, road, on Node 2, we have instigated what we call a road trip, where several members from our local community here 
we'll go ahead and go over to like Ocean Springs to visit uh, other clubs in the other parts of the country. These road trips are successful and we have found that there are a lot of other people who use the computers throughout the country. And that is amazing. Tell me, Mr. Boudreaux, isn't there a way that people can use their computers to get information on, on meetings and other such goings on when nobody else is available? Oh yes, Chris, there's several ways. The, the best and the most economical way for a person to learn how to stay in touch with his community would be an electronic bulletin board. With this, there's several of them in the city. The one that the color computer uses is called Park Place. Their phone number will be flashed up on the screen for you. And uh, when we call this, we use it for information. We have uh, personal mail that we leave for one another on here, messages, forms. We have mail that comes in from virtually California. Uh, Ocean Springs, Homer, all type of remote areas. And this is our more or less electronic collection box of uh, information. But to get into it, you can use any type of computer. The one thing you would need would be a modem. Right. And they're not very expensive. I've seen them range anywhere from uh, $49.95 all the way up to $300, depending on what you want them to do. So with this simple attachment, no matter what computer you have, you can just attach it to your computer and talk over the phone. Yeah. And couldn't they also use the same method to get public domain type programs? Oh, absolutely. On uh, bulletin boards throughout the city, different computer users will find that uh, they have uh, programs for them to have and to keep uh, and to use at no charge for the public. Right. And this is really amazing because you can do all this with a computer even this small. And the, the size of this computer is confusing a lot of people. Even though it is small, there is a lot of power in this case. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. With upgrades, it can be as powerful as uh, any commercial equipment sold on the market today. Right. Well, that's about all the time we have for this short segment. See y'all later. Remember that using your computer is a process best learned by repetition, so spend a little time with the computer and get to know the information we've given. Remember, if you have a problem with any of the information we've supplied, give us a call. One of our many experienced members of our club will be more than glad to help you with your information. If you missed a show, let us know. We can have a tape of the show you missed ready for you to view at the next meeting. That's about all the time we have for now. So tune in again next time when we continue to learn your color computer.